there's a lot of work previously on what are called cellular automata, um, the most famous of which is Conway's Game of Life. There's this infinite discrete grid, and at any given time, the grid is either occupied by a cell or it's empty. And there's a very simple rule that, uh, that tells you how these cells evolve. So sometimes cells live and sometimes they, they die. Um, and this, um, you know, um, when I was a, a student, uh, it was a very popular screensaver to actually just have these these animations like go on. And, and they look very chaotic. In fact, they look a little bit like turbulent flow sometimes. But at some point, people discovered more and more interesting structures within this game of life. Um, so, for example, they discovered this thing called a glider. So a glider is a very tiny configuration of like four or five cells, which evolves and it just moves at a certain direction. And that's like this this vortex rings. This analog. Um, yeah, so this is an analogy. The game of life is kind of like a discrete equation and and um, the fluid Navier-Stokes is, is a continuous equation, but mathematically, they have some similar features. Um, and um, so over time, people discovered more and more interesting things that you could build within the game of life. The game of life is a very simple system. It only has like three or four rules um, to, to do it, but, but you can design all kinds of interesting configurations inside it. Um, there's something called a glider gun that does nothing to spit out gliders one at a, one, one at a time. Um, and then after a lot of effort, people managed to, to create um, hand gates and or gates for gliders. Like this is massive, ridiculous structure, which if you if a, if a, if you have a stream of gliders um, coming in here and a stream of gliders coming in here, then you may produce a stream of gliders coming out if, if so maybe if both of, of the um, streams um, have gliders, then there'll be an out output stream. But if only one of them does, then nothing comes out. Mm -hmm. So they could build something like that. And once you could build an, um, these basic gates, then just from software engineering, you can build almost anything. Um, you can build a Turing machine. I mean, it's, it's like an enormous steampunk type things. They look ridiculous. But then people also generated self-replicating objects in the game of life. A massive machine, a bonhomme machine, which over a lot, huge period of time, and there were always little like, glider guns inside doing these very steampunk calculations, it would create another version of itself which could replicate. It's that. so incredible. A lot of this was like community crowdsourced by uh, like amateur mathematicians, actually. Um, so I knew about that 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 work, and so th that is part of what inspired me to propose the same thing for Navier Stokes. Um, now, it is a much, as I said, analog is much worse than digital. Like it's going to be, um, you can't just directly take the constructions in the game of life and plunk them in. But again, it just it shows it's possible. You know, there's a kind of emergence that happens with these cellular automata local rules mm -hmm. maybe it's similar to fluids i don't know but local rules operating at scale can create these incredibly complex dynamic structures do you think any of that is amenable to mathematical analysis do we have the tools to say something profound about that the thing is you can get these emergent, very complicated structures, but only with very carefully prepared initial conditions. Yeah. So, so these 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 glider guns and and gates and and sort of machines. If you just plonk on randomly some cells and you run the game you will not see any of these. Um, and th that's the analogous situation with Navier Stokes again. You know that that with with typical initial conditions, you will not you will not have any of this weird computation going on. Um, but basically through engineering, you know, by 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 specially designing things in a very special way, you can pick clever constructions. I wonder if it's possible to prove the sort of the negative of like, basically prove that only through engineering can you ever yeah. create yeah, yeah, yeah. something uh, interesting. This this is a recurring challenge in mathematics that um, I call the dichotomy between structure and randomness. That most objects that you can generate in mathematics are random. Uh, they look like random, like the digits of pi. Well, we believe is a good example. Um, but there's a very small number of things that have patterns. Um, but um, now you can prove something as a pattern by just constructing, you know, like if, if something has a simple pattern and you have a proof that it, it does something like repeat itself every so often, you can do that. But, um, and you, you can prove that, that for example, you can, you can prove that most sequences of, of digits have no pattern. Um, so like if, if you just pick digits randomly, there's something called the low large numbers. It tells you you're going to get as many ones as, as twos in the long run. Um, but, um, we have a lot fewer tools to, 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 if I give you a specific pattern like the digits of pi, how can I show that this doesn't have some weird pattern to it? Some other work that I spend a lot of time on is to prove what are called structure theorems or inverse theorems that give tests for when something is, is very structured. So some functions are what's called additive. Like if you have a function that matches the natural numbers, the natural numbers. So, so maybe, um, 
you know, two maps to four, three maps to six, and so forth. Um, some functions what's called, called additive, which means that if you add if you add two inputs together, the output gets gets added as well. Uh, for example, uh, multiply by a constant. If you multiply a number by ten, um, if you if, if you multiply a plus b by ten, that's the same as multiplying a by ten and b by ten and then adding them together. So some um, functions are additive. Some functions are kind of additive, but not completely additive. Um, so, for example, if I take a number n, I multiply by the square root of two, and I take the integer part of that. So 10 by square root of 2 is like 14 point something, so 10 up to 14. Um, 20 up to 28. Um, so in that case, ad additivity is true then, so 10 plus 10 is 20, and 14 plus 14 is 28. But because of this rounding, uh, sometimes there's round-off errors, and, and sometimes when you um, add a plus b, this function doesn't quite give you the sum of, of the two individual outputs, but the sum plus or minus 1. Um, so it's almost additive, but not quite additive. Um, so there's a lot of useful results in mathematics, and I've worked a lot on developing things like this, to the effect that if, if a function exhibits some structure like this, then um, it's basically, there's a reason for why it's true, and the reason is because there's, there's some other nearby function which is actually um, com completely structured, which is explaining this sort of partial pattern that you have. Um, and so if you have these sort of inverse theorems, it, um, it creates this sort of dichotomy that, that either the objects that you study are either have no structure at all, or they are somehow related to something that is structured, um, and in either way, in either um, uh, in either case, you can make progress. Um, a good example of this is that there's this old theorem in mathematics called Semmerides' theorem, uh, proven in the 1970s. It concerns trying to find a certain type of pattern in a set of numbers. The, the pattern is arithmetic progression, things like three, five, and seven, or, or, or ten, fifteen, and twenty. And Semmerides, Andre Semmerides, proved that um, any set of, of numbers that is sufficiently big. Uh, what's, called, what's called positive density, has um, arithmetic progressions in it of, of any length you wish. Um, so, for example, um, the odd numbers have a set of density one half, um, and they contain arithmetic progressions of any length. Um, so in that case, it's obvious because the, the, the odd numbers are really, really structured. I can just take uh, 11, 13, 15, 17. I can, just, I can, I can easily find arithmetic progressions in, in, in that set. Um, but um, Zermodism also applies to random sets. If, if I take the set of all numbers, and I flip a coin um, and I, uh, for each number, and I only keep the numbers which for which I got a heads. Okay, so I just flip coins, I just randomly take out half the numbers, I keep one half. So that's a set that has no, no patterns at all. But just from random fluctuations, you will still get a lot of, um, um, of arithmetic prog progressions in that set. Can you prove that there's arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length within a random... Yes. Um, have you heard of the infinite monkey theorem? Usually, mathematicians give boring names to theorems, but occasionally yeah. they, they give colorful names. Yes. The popular version of the infinite monkey theorem is that if you have an infinite number of monkeys in a room with each of a typewriter, they type out uh, text randomly. Almost surely, one of them is going to generate the entire script of Hamlet or any other finite string of text. Uh, it will just take some time, uh, quite a lot of time, actually. But if you have an infinite number, then it happens. Um, so um, basically, the theorem says that if you take an infinite string of, of digits or whatever, um, eventually any finite pattern you wish will emerge. Uh, it may take a long time, but it will eventually happen. Um, in particular, arithmetic progressions of any length will eventually happen, Okay, but you, need, uh, you, but you need an extremely long random sequence for this to happen. I suppose that's intuitive. It's just infinity. Yeah, infinity absorbs a lot of sins. Yeah. How are we humans supposed to deal with infinity? Well, you can think of infinity as, as just an abstraction of um, a finite number for which you d you do not have a bound for. Um, that uh, you know, I mean, so nothing in real life is truly infinite. Um, but you know, you can um, you know, you can ask yourself questions like, you know, what if I had as much money as I wanted? You know, or what if I could go as fast as I wanted? And a way in which mathematicians formalize that is mathematics has found a formalism to idealize instead of something being extremely large or extremely small to actually be exactly infinite or zero. Um, and often the, the mathematics becomes a, a lot cleaner when you do that. I mean, in, in physics, we, we joke about uh, assuming spherical cows. Um, you know, like, real-world problems have got all kinds of real-world effects, but you can idealize, send certain things to infinity, send some, certain things to zero. Um, and, um, and the mathematics becomes a lot simpler to work with there. I wonder how often using infinity uh, forces us to deviate from um, the physics of reality. 
Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, so you know, we we spend a lot of time in you know, undergraduate math classes teaching analysis, um, and analysis is often about how to take limits and 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 whether you, you know. So for example, a plus b is always b plus a. Um, so when when you have a finite number of terms and you add them, you can swap them, and there's no, there's no problem. But when you have an infinite number of terms, there are these sort of shell games you can play where you can have a series which converges to one value, but you rearrange it, and it suddenly converges to another value. And so you can make mistakes. You have to know what you're doing when you allow infinity. Um, you have to introduce these epsilons and deltas, and, and, and there's, there's a certain type of way of reasoning that helps you avoid mistakes. Um, in re more recent years, um, people have started taking results that are true in, in infinite limits and what's called, and what's called finitizing them. Um, so you know that something's true eventually, but um, you don't know when. Now give me a rate, okay? So such that if I have, don't have an infinite number of monkeys, but but a large finite number of monkeys, how long do I have to wait for Hamlet to come out? Um, and um, that's a more qual quantitative question. Um, and this is something that you can you can um, attack by purely finite methods, and you can use your finite intuition. Um, and in, in this case, it turns out to be exponential in the length of the text that you're, you're trying to generate. Um, so, if, um, and so this is why you never see the monkeys create Hamlet. You can maybe see them create a four-letter word, but not, nothing that big. And so, I personally find once you finitize an infinite statement, it's, it does become much more intuitive, uh, and it's no longer so so weird. Um, so, even if you're working with infinity, it's good to finitize so that you can have some intuition. Yeah, the downside is that the finitized proofs are just much much messier, yeah. and and uh, yeah. So, the, so the infinite ones I found first. Usually, like decades earlier, uh, and then later on, people finalize them.